I'll hit this. All right, so it should be recording. It's a makeup. And first of all, I got to apologize for those watching now. Uh, somehow it screwed up, and I'll take total fault for when we transferred from Jimmy and I. Everything that Jimmy was on worked. Everything that I had didn't work. And so that's kind of why we're going to rehash the second half today. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and share the screen. And, and Fred, if you don't mind, we may do this a little different. We'll tag team it off. If there's anything that you jump in, you want to see your ad or take away, we can go from there. Let me get the share screen going. All right, so once again, the whole whole purpose of Saturday's uh, webinar was the, the leadership council that, that that we're using right now. Obviously, it wasn't my idea. I stole it from somebody else like any good good coach, right? And I'm just a really good thief. And so all the ideas I have here are kind of more from other people's ideas and stuff that we worked on both through myself and through the players. And so as you'll see in the second part, whenever uh, Andrew does his, his voodoo magic and combines it all together and makes it one, you'll see this. The idea that I originally got it from was from this book right here. And like I said on Saturday, this is an unbelievably good book that, that my wife got for me because she was in the uh, Christian Coach's Wife's organization and heard about Randy Allen. And Randy Allen, uh, I guess we had dealt with back when I was in high school, he was at uh, Abilene High, or uh, yeah, Abilene High or Abilene Cooper, I believe. But he wrote this book and, and that's where I got the first round or the original idea for Leadership Council. But more than just a leadership council, he has some really good ideas on how to handle booster club, uh, all kinds of different topics. And I, you know, if I could think of anything, I'd get a brand new coach that starting a head coaching job. This would probably be the book. I've got the link here, and it's already been put into the webinar resources. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube at the time, just email me at uh, membership at tascosoccer dot com. You can find that on our Tasco website, and I'll make sure to add you to the webinar list and send you a link. But you see in the bottom right here, that's actually linked to it. It's only like six bucks and it's, it's well worth the money. It's not very long. It'll probably take you a week to read. And it's unbelievably interesting. The second part, so the idea of Leadership Council came from that Randy Allen book. And I tried it before uh, in Midland, but not the success that I had here in uh, Colorado Heritage. Uh, there's uh, John Wooden's book that uh, another great read if you ever get a chance to, to read and, and you're into that in leadership. I strongly recommend John Wooden. He was the, the coach at UCLA. But more importantly, these books right here changed everything I've done as far as leadership and, and coaching. So it started off with the Leadership Council. So the first year I got here to Colleyville Bell Heritage, we established Leadership Council. And the idea behind the Leadership Council is that anybody could be a part. You didn't have to um, be chosen for it or anything like that. And it's anybody from freshman to senior, I didn't care. You know, I figured, you know, part of the things that we have is, uh, actually let me back up a bit. If you'd been on the, the link, and were with us on Saturday morning, we did a poll. And the poll results stated that almost 90% of the coaches that were in on Saturday morning uh, had at one point said the reason we didn't do well is because of the leadership of the team. But then only 40% of the, the coaches in that same poll that we did on Saturday morning said that they actually had a leadership training program. So taking that into consideration, reading the book, getting to Colleyville Heritage, starting off this program that I was here, and just to give some background on Colorado Heritage when I got here I was the fifth coach in four years the previous year they'd gone through three different coaches in one year so the, the team was in shambles great unbelievably great good kids and and you'll know it too when you watch the second half of this and you see the guys that are online you'll see the quality of kids that we have here so the the pieces of the tools were there right there's no doubt the second part of that was the ownership the idea of extreme ownership so if I could think any book that is necessary to whether you're a, a leader in school whether principal, leader in the real world, whether it be in, in business or whatnot, I would say these books are probably critical to your understanding and development as a leader. And extreme ownership is part of it. And, you know, one of the interesting things that Jocko says, not only in these books, but also on his uh, podcast that I've got the link for down here, is that leadership is the most important thing on the battlefield, right? And there's actually some really good um, studies done on it, like even with fighter pilots. It's not the airplane that makes the dogfight a guaranteed win you can have the best fighter in the world but the pilot that flies it is the one that makes a difference the great determining factor of either one is the leadership of the, the group the man that leads it the things that happen and it starts off with extreme ownership all right so one of the things he talks about too is that to give an example of leadership he talks about in this first one and the only thing i hate hate doing this because i hate giving the story of the book before we ever get into it but he talks about when he was uh leading training at coronado and everybody's seen the the seal movies you know where he, You've got buds, and buds is just the beginnings of being a SEAL. And they had this two boat crews. They had the boat crew that never won anything. And if you watch those, those shows about it, 
and you see that if you lose, you pay unbelievable amounts of punishment, and the goal is to pay to be winner. Well, they had the one group, a different team that won everything. Every time they did any competition, that girl, the boat crew knocked out of the park, and they were amazing, won every contest, and they were sitting at the end. So being them, they decided to do an on, on-site leadership experiment. They took the number one leader from the best boat crew, they took the leader from the crappy boat crew, and they switched them just to kind of see what happened. Is it the leader that made the difference in the, in the race, or was it the, the men in the program? Because, you know, we've also had the thing as well, I can't win because of my kids, or, you know, all the excuses you hear. So they flipped it. Well, it turned out the leader from the best boat crew got that team kicked off and going. Those guys raised their level to where they're competing the first or second every round. But the interesting thing is when they put the crappy leader into the first boat crew, it turned out they still competed because, you know, the players within the group or the, the SEALs within that group were expected to win, and actually they pushed their leader to be better. And so those two became the top two boat crews in the deal. And so that being said, as we look at our teams, and for all those that said leadership's a problem, extreme ownership says whatever happens on that team, I hate to tell you this, there's only one guy you can look at. Anything that happens within that team is your fault. And that has to be the way you look at it. You know, every problem within the team is your fault. So let's say the weather's bad. Well, you can say, okay, well, maybe that's not your fault, but did you have a plan for the weather? What did you do? You know, if something happens within the team, everything has to be labeled out and you have to be willing to take it out. There's another one I didn't talk about in, the, in those podcasts this Saturday, I wish I had, because you always look back and you see the different things. But it talked about... Um, the opening chapter, I believe this book is, is uh, on extreme ownership and it goes into it, is they had a, a battle in Ramadi, their first day out in the battlefield. They go out there in uh, a group, they had sent out, I guess the, the relief force of tanks were coming up on this one house and they're calling in for air support because they're getting unbelievable amounts of fire from this one house and they can't understand what's going on, but that one house is pinning all these guys down with their tanks. And they call in, they call in an airstrike. Well, at the same time, there's a SEAL platoon inside a house calling out and say, hey, we're under extreme attack. We don't know where these guys got tanks or anything like that, but we're under unbelievable amounts of fire. And so both of those are going at each other, and they're both firing, and they're calling in the airstrike. Well, Jocko listens to both of them. He gets out of his Humvee, walks in the middle of everybody screaming out of stop, and he screams out a guy's name. Well, it turns out the people in the house were the SEALs, and the people outside the house were the U.S. Army, and they're about to, to kill all the SEALs. Well, they end up killing one of the Iraqi insurgents or one of the Iraqi not insurgents, one of the Iraqis that were helping them, and they all go in. Well, if you guys know anything about military, even in our world, that's pretty much guaranteed you're fired. I mean, you're done. I mean, there's no explanation for it. Whenever you have a blue-on-blue -blue event where you kill your own people, that's a bad thing. So they all start putting it together. Well, the lead SEAL in Iraq at that time comes in, and the lead master chief comes in, and they, do the, they come in to do the investigation, to make a long story short. They come in, they go around, they say, okay, Jocko walks in, because usually what happens with people, the first thing they do is they're going to blame every somebody else, right? I'm not going to take any credit, so it's somebody else's fault. So he, Jocko comes in, okay, whose fault was it? Well, the first guy comes to him and said, you know, it's my fault. I should have looked up and made sure that guy was there. And then another guy said, well, you know, no, that's not right, because it was my fault, because I should have known where we were at. And another guy said, no, it's my fault. Well, then Jocko stepped up and said, you know, all y'all are wrong. It's 100% my fault. It was my deal. I should have trained you better. should have done this. And through all that, Nobody got fired. They found out it was a mistake and things happened and got fixed because everybody's willing to accept the responsibility for the team. And I think, you know, one of the things you'll notice within the, the group on the second half of this, this podcast or this uh, video, rather, you'll notice that the players that are going to talk are those same guys that are willing to step up. And there's one example coming up here in a minute that was a ex direct example of guys being willing to step up and say, you know what, if it fails, it's my fault. Now, being my fault is only half of it. Then you have to fix it, obviously. I mean, can't blame yourself for everything then you find a plan to work on so that's kind of the base of it but I'll tell you what if I was to start all over this thing and I was to do a leadership council and I was going to have our book study I would start off with the one on the right that leadership strategy and tactics it breaks it down into small bits and pieces which is easy for like a monthly or a, sorry or a weekly uh, book study and we do it once a week every Friday we'll do a 30 minute book study where they've got to read it and we'll show you that some of that in a second okay here's the structure of leadership council so it's obviously morphed and it's growing every year. It's going to change and, and hopefully five years from now, it'll look nothing like this and we'll find ways to improve it. But the first thing is I thought when we were going to do this, it had to be open to every single person on the team. Because to me, every single person is a leader, whether or not they have the captain's pink band on their arm, or whether or not they're a head of a, a part of the team or a position group or anything, everybody's a leader. Everybody has to have an idea of what's going on. 
And so it's open to every single player, whether freshman, whether senior, whether they're in football, basketball, whatever. As long as they're a part of soccer, they're here. If you remember, you must attend each week before practice, once a week for 30 minutes. And what we do it is we've got a before school lifting program that the guys have, have put together. And this is going to be an interesting thing you're seeing in a minute. But before they come to that, we meet for 30 minutes. We go over that chapter of the book. They have to read it. And then the way I check it, uh, you'll see here in a second as well, is I have a Google form where they fill out. That also allows me to keep attendance. But if you're going to be part of leadership council, you've got to commit to reading the book, right? You've got to be able to discuss it, right? You have to be able to talk about what you read and be able to apply it to the team because the, the first one, extreme ownership, it's a, a leadership example based out of the bottle of Ramadi. So everything's a, a battle uh, story, but then he directly correlates it to business because now they're in a, a business and consulting leadership firm. And so they've tried to mirror it to that. If you're going to be on the ballot to be a captain, you must be a member of leadership council. I know that, that some kids have written themselves in the past that weren't part of leadership council, but they get removed instantly. Because to me, if you're going to commit to, to learn how to be a leader, and if I'm not going to use that excuse that this year is a problem of leadership, then those that are in the leadership council hopefully have been trained to, to be able to lead. And so now I can't blame it on them anymore. Once again, it comes my fault because I'm the one that taught them how to lead. And so if it's a failure, it's a failure on my part. The classification of players does not affect the eligibility of captain selection. You know, and, and this is kind of true because I think when kids start to buy in, the kids know what's right and wrong, right? My belief is that every single player knows exactly what it takes to be the best they can be. Very few are willing to do it, but every kid does. And so as an example of that this year, the captains were both selected, were both juniors. So the team, I asked them, okay, who's picked letter? Here's the leadership member, council members. The team was looking realistically on who should lead the team. They picked two juniors. The seniors class wasn't a good leadership group. And like I said, you've had all of us had that where you pick a senior and the leadership's not so good, but the team saw through that. They pick kids that lead. Now you're expected to speak openly and honestly. Now that's, this is going to be a thing is you're going to see the reasons why it doesn't work here in a minute. You have to be open to them being honest to you. You can get your feathers ruffled if they tell you something you don't want to hear or you don't like. If you ask a question and you really want to know the answer, you better be expecting to have those answers. Same time, the first time that you shy away or act like you're upset because they give an answer, you shut down the whole leadership council because no longer will they trust what they have to say is open and their opinions valid. And so it's unbelievably important for that to happen. Each session will cover the good and the bad of the program. Every time we end it, we say, okay, what's good? And then on the conversely, we say, okay, what do we need to improve? How do we get better? What's better? Because nothing's ever perfect. And we're always going to find ways to improve it. Then it becomes the, the priority leadership council when they go out to affect that within the team. So say, for example, not enough kids were showing up before school to lift. Well, that's on them. They got to find a way to get back in. You know, now it's kind of a funny, funny dichotomy because when I say everything goes wrong with the program is my fault, through this leadership training, they start to understand that whatever's wrong with the program is their fault. You know, it's kind of a, a crazy the way it happens. And that kind of goes on down the, the chain of command. So throughout the whole deal, every single deal has to take ownership with what's happening with them within the team, whether it be up to me or myself to the principal or myself to athletic director. You know, you lead up and down the chain of command. So both sides have to happen. So whether the kid has a problem with somebody below them or up to me, they're, they're responsible for that. And part of that is that they got to be able to speak openly. So if there is a problem, you got to expect it to come up. Um, the most important thing of all this in leadership council is you must keep your ego in check. And it's funny, it's gotten to the point where now the guys kind of whenever some kids spouting off or saying, I can't do this or I can't do that, you know, they're now in the habit of saying, oh, hey, is that your ego talking? And so ego has become a thing that we try to keep each other in check because when ego becomes getting, or starts to get in the way, you start losing the ability to perform and to get better as a player. Now, confidence and ego are two different things, right? You want people to be confident, but at the same time, you don't want their ego to get in the way of what's going on. And so that's something that, that the guys hold each other responsible for. If somebody spouts off or says, I got this or I got that, they're quick to say, hey, you know, you got to get your ego on check. Next thing is the ride. all the rules apply to the coach as well. So if I say you got to be there early, or if I got, I got to be there early. You know, if I say you got to wear the certain outfit, you got to wear the certain outfit. So for example, on game days, on Fridays, we wear a, a tie and a nice shirt, you know, a long sleeve shirt, a tie, button up shirt and, and khakis. Well, I can't tell them that and then I do it myself. And so anything that I tell the boys to do, then we're going to have to do it together. And then you must complete activity to sign. And at the end of the thing, you're going to see the ethos that the boys came up with. And it's kind of a funny story with that. We'll talk that in a minute. So whatever we assign to the team, they've got to be willing to do it. Otherwise, you don't need to be in leadership council, right? And here's kind of where it came from. I believe that everyone 
knows how to be successful. Everyone knows how to be successful. Every single, there's not a single person out there can't tell you what it's going to take to be the best they can be. The special ones are willing to do what it takes. And that's kind of where we're getting with them on that. Okay. Things to keep it from not working. Now, like I told them on Saturday, this is kind of my list. Sometimes a lot of these things are learned from my own self. And so when I put these things up, it's not that I'm the expert in it. It's because I failed in some of these things. The ego of the coaching staff. You know, I can think early on in my career that, you know, by God, we're going to do it this way. And some kid would say something and say, no, I'm the coach. This is the way we're going to do it. You know, and you got to be able to put that aside. You can't have it, have a leadership council. You can't have it both ways. In other words, you got to be able to listen to the guys, but you also have to be able to, to, to hold yourself steadfast to what happens. But anytime ego gets in the way, you're done. Taking the glory or credit for what's accomplished, right? You have to be able to put that on the shelf. Because if you're going to honestly engage the kids in and then you win lots of games and you come back and say, you know, well, the reason we're 19 and no is because of me, you just destroyed the leadership council, right? I think anybody that's there in any kind of leadership books, you always take all the problems as you, all the, the deficiencies, all the faults are yours, and all the successes of the team or the, the people that do it. When you start doing that and living that, they'll fall in. Next thing, you can't be defensive. So if I ask, you know, hey, what do you think of the formation? Or they bring up, hey, the formation's wrong or this, that. The second I go defensive, negates anything that they're willing to talk to you about again. All right. So sometimes you've got to put that ego on the shelf back up a bit, listen to what they got to say and take it to heart and see where they're coming from, but then turn around and be able to explain the why. So I may not agree with everything they have, right? I may not agree with what they say. There may be something they come up in there. They're wholehearted too. This is going to happen, but experience has told me different. Well, if I'm going to go against what they say, and a lot of times I do, you know, you've got to be able to explain why. So if they say, you know, we want to change this formation. They say, well, no, here's why we can't do that, right? Or we need this. You say, no, here's why we can't do it. And you got to be explaining why. You can't just say, because I, I said so, or because I'm the coach. Because the second you say that, you lose validity as any kind of leader, because nobody's going to listen to you anymore, right? But you say, okay, yeah, let's look at that and let's see if we can make it work. Or, you know, we can't do that. And here's why it won't work. Or here's why we do what we do. You know, not leading by example. You know, if we're talking about character, talk about leadership, but you don't exhibit good character, you know, if you cheat in games and do stuff like that, but you're telling them not to cheat, you've just lost all, all credibility as a leader, right? So you have to be able to lead. So whatever you say has to be followed up. Uh, not being prepared for the meeting and not having read the chapter yourself. And then you guys know this too. If anybody's been in any kind of classroom, you know when the teacher hadn't prepared, right? It's, it's a fiasco. And the kids know it too. So if you're going to hold them accountable to read beforehand, you have to know what's coming up in that book. In fact, sometimes I would, I would suggest staying two or three chapters ahead. If not, Read the whole book first yourself, and then know where it's going to be able to lead the class. Hey, Warren, uh, you might be covering this later. What do you do when players aren't reading? Uh, they don't come. You know, so well, the first time, here's kind of funny thing. You don't ever yell at anybody, and I'm not a big screamer. I used to be a big time <coughs> screamer. But now it's gotten to the point where, say, somebody comes in, they haven't read a coach. And I'm ready. I say, okay, well, you know what you had to do to get here, right? And they go, yeah. And I say, well, why didn't you read? You know, if, if you want to be a part of the group, what's it going to take? Oh, you got to read. Okay. So next time you don't read, don't come, you know, you've got to be prepared to be a part. And then now it goes back to the why, because what we're trying to do is prepare you to lead a team. And if I was to, to do this to you, and this way I always turn around on them, what would you think of me if I was your leader and you weren't even willing to do what it took to read a chapter? What would that tell the rest of the boys that you're trying to lead? And how would you look at you? And so that's kind of a funny way of always turn it back on them. You know, I, I'm trying to get out of the, the time where I always tell them what to do all the time, if that makes sense. And so a lot of times they just won't come, you know, and then when they go come over time, they'll fade off and then they're off leadership council because none of this is mandatory and I can't make them do anything. And that's the next part of you'll see some of the stuff is you can't make them do anything. And that's, that's something that has to be done. And that's what's really worked really well for us. Does that kind of answer Fred? Yeah. Thank you. Hey, and, and man, please just say, since we're redoing this and just you and me, Anytime you see something, jump in, because you're just going to add the flavor to it. So if I'm not covering it well enough, I need you to help me out. Oh, I got you. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Now, not taking ownership of failures and mistakes, even if, though they may not be your fault. Now, that's kind of a crazy one, because it's still your fault. You're still a team, so if something bad happens, let's say somebody goes out drinking the night before, or on Friday night, come back, or he gets arrested. It may not be fault, your fault, but you know, at the end of the day, you're still responsible for that program. What could you do different to make that not happen again? Right. And it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow. And the number one thing you're going to find with people that start going with the extreme ownership thing, they're always going to want to say, Hey, they need to take extreme ownership or the boys should take extreme. No, no, that's not the way this thing works. Now, extreme ownership to say, it's all my fault all the time. It's my fault. And by God, we're going to fix it. That's going to change. We're going to find a way to surf and we're going to try a way to make it work because we're going to make the same stupid mistakes over and over again and say, it's my fault. That's not the way it happens. 
okay? Remember that you're responsible for everything that happens. You'll not always agree to do what they bring up, but you always have to be able to explain the why. Even if they don't agree, they should understand how you feel, right? And they may not always agree with you, but they should always understand where you're coming from. If you do that, you're okay. Now, this, the most telling one of all, and this kind of comes from that bro crew thing, there's no such thing as bad teams, only bad leaders. And like I said, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, but that's up in my office, by the way, and that's the high school. Kind of keeps me in check. Okay, to continue on. This is something that actually I got from me all, all the years I've gone to Tasco clinics. And so part of that is something used to irritate the crap out of me is, and, and not anybody that's gonna listen to this call, but there's some past leaders that you go to the clinics and they would just sit off in the side and they'd just be talking the whole time. And there's unbelievable wealth of knowledge that every time you go to a clinic, you learn. There's all kinds of things in game. I, I can still, when I, I teach my coaching courses up here in North Texas, I still learn. I, I learned from going to the U11 modules. I learned this a couple years ago watching uh, the now the equivalent of a D course. There's always something to be gained. And so that's kind of what I want to put on here. If you're not willing to improve your craft, if you're not willing to attend all the clinics you can, talk to other coaches, share what you learn, then you reach the point where you say, I don't need to go to a clinic or learn something new. It's probably time for you to get out of the game. There's no way this stuff's going to work for you because the kids also see through that too. You can't do the same things over and over again that you did in 1995 because it doesn't work anymore. The game evolves, people evolve, and people change. The next biggest one, this may be the most important one, is not being able to forgive, right? You're going to have issues with players, but I think anybody that's done this long enough can remember the kid that's a junior that's a total turd, a pain in the rear all year long, can't stand this kid, try to do everything you can to make him work, and you just get through the deal. Well, if you look back on it long enough, you'll also find that that kid usually is a kid that comes around a senior year and it's lights out and outperforms everything. Now, this doesn't happen all the time, but usually the, the kids that are gold are the ones that do that. They find a way. They all grow up. They all mature. But if you're unwilling to forgive that kid for the junior year or some past, some past thing that made you mad, something that happened in the past, then you'll never get beyond what it's going to take to make it good. Right? Plus, you've also shown that kid that you know, you're one and done, and that's not, not good either. Thinking that yelling and screaming gets results. Right? So how many of you all know from the past that screaming and shouting at people thought that worked? Well, you know, it works for a while. But at the end of the day, all you're doing is exchange of motivation. you got to find a way to get the kids to do it. Leadership council has been beautiful for that because it puts them back in their, in their role and gives them ownership to what happens. Now, there's another great quote I got from Jocko. And, and like I said, if, I'm surprised nobody asked on the deal about getting tired of listening to Jocko because they hear it all the time. <laughs> but you have to detach from those emotions. Step back from them a little so they don't control you. So if you see yourself getting that bowling point, you got to sit back, relax, breathe, and then re-hit it again. I've got to learn this both referees, by the way. I'm really bad about this. <laughs> this is my weakness in, in the game. All right, not being consistent. So if you say something, you better dang well follow through it, you know, good or bad, or be smart enough to say, look, you know, that was my fault. I made a bad decision and be able to back off and, and restate it and explain why. But if you're not consistent, they'll see through you, right? Not following through what you decide on your rules based on players' perceived ability or the importance to the team. Right, so there's sometimes you make a rule and the top kid gets there. Well, he doesn't get it. Well, I hate to say you just lost all credibility to the team. If a, the smallest kid on the team gets punished, but the top kid doesn't for the same infraction, it, who wants to follow that, right? You gotta be able to stand with it. And then it goes back to no such thing as bad teams, only bad leaders. Okay, so kind of to answer your question, Fred, on how do you know they haven't read it? Well, this is an example of it. You know, this is what we do, and this is on uh, September 13th of this year, right? And you notice there's only 11 kids that were at leadership council that day. And then what I do is go through and you get their name, last name, first name. So that's how I keep the attendance in it. And it puts it all into uh, Google Sheets so I can keep track of everything. And all it does is says, what does leading up town chain of command mean to you? And this funny thing is that extreme ownership. The first year I was here, I did it. Uh, last spring, I asked the leadership council what book they wanted to cover this, this fall. And that's the one thing they came back and we haven't done extreme ownership with the new guys. And so it's almost like they've been asking for that book every two years. They're, they're coming back to that. <laughs> okay. Now here's how I kind of find out if they read or not. What was the issue with the seals and what were they asked, asked to do that nobody wanted to do? And so now you gotta think, Hmm, if you hadn't read the book, you would have no idea what this is talking about because when they walk in the room, it's silent. And their first thing is to, I have a QR code on the deal. They get their phone out and they scan the QR code. And then they start answering the questions, but it's silence until we start talking about it. Now, to kind of show you, this is Moo, and Moo is on the, on the call, as you'll see at the end. He was our goalkeeper last year. It's Mohi Mathani. 
They said, how does this demonstrate the importance of the role of leadership council? What's your responsibility as leader on this team to make the season great? And then if you put, see what he wrote down, if there are questions in that team, bring them up to coach. And so now you can start seeing that he's already starting to think, okay, it's my responsibility to, to bring up stuff that we, have, we may have issues with to the team. Then explain the answers to the rest of the team. I'm an important intermediary between the coach and the rest of the team. And so, for example, I think what we're covering on this one is that not always are going to agree. So some kids will come and say, well, you know, for example, why are we going up before school and lifting? And why are we doing that? And so they'll come to me and they'll say, why are we doing that? And I explain it to them. Now, they may not always agree with me, but their job is to go back and relate it back in in the same positive light that I'm giving it to them. Now, they're not yes men, yeah. but they've got to explain the, and we call it commander's intent, the reason why we're doing what we're doing, and here's why it is, and here's what we're going to do, and here's why we're doing it. Now, if there's an issue, they can bring it up in leadership council and say, well, here's what we think, and then we'll talk about it. And if it needs to change, you got to be willing to change. I mean, that's just it. It's a, it's a community of guys for one goal, and it's all of us together in the same team. Or did you, did you put all these uh, like uh, your yes not just the slides but also the, like the Google Docs and stuff like that on the, the which uh, one like the Google Docs like that that stuff right there if we want to pick up a book and do the same thing so the work's kind of already done for us. Hey, do you want me to? I can attach. Do you want me to attach one of the Google Forms to the deal? I can do that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah, for sure. What I'll do is I'll go that and do that today. I'll put in one of the. I'll pick one of them and I'll put it up there. Cool. Thank so you. He has access to it. All right, here's some of the things that have happened. I could talk about before, I'm the fifth coach in four years, right? And so I was a, when I first got here, I was the, the fifth one in four years and the one before is three. The growth of the program, we didn't have many players and we were struggling for the last couple of years to just even keep a JV two. But now my freshman class, I think looking at this next year, we're at 28 freshmen. So the numbers are starting to come recover. Uh, lifting before school. Now here's what's crazy, All right? Two years ago, and this came from, from some of the kids is that I thought, okay, crap. We've got, to, we've got to play every day because we don't have a lot of club players in our group. And so I said, okay, well, we got 50 minutes. In that 50 minutes, we can either lift and play every now and then, or we can play every day and lift before school. And so I said, okay, well, here's optional. And you got to understand this is 100% optional. Because if I start telling people what to do, or if I go and tell people, then that means nothing to them, right? They find excuses to get out because I can't make them. And that's the, the key. If they're truly going to buy in and believe, they got to think they did it on their own. So when we started the year before last, I had probably 20 kids coming out. But on training day, as I said, lifting is important to us because one way or the other, we're going to get the lifting in. So if you're not there in the morning, it's not a big deal. I don't yell and scream. Don't throw a fit. We just set up a speaker in a Metcon and they work out and the guys play soccer. And I'm not angry. Don't yell. Nothing of that kind of stuff because the whole point was it cannot be made to happen. I can't make you do it. And I don't want to make you do it because if I'm making you do it, then it means nothing. And so I even had leadership council one day they come and say, coach, you're going to have to make them do it. Otherwise, you're not going to come. And I said, well, you're missing the point. I can't make you do anything. And the second I make you do it, it means nothing. So this last year, we went from 20 or so kids to all but five showing up every morning before school. And nobody's told anything. Now, this year kind of show you the power of that, that statement that it can't be told what to do. Neither myself nor Coach Evans, my assistant, could be in there all the time because I was in football. I got moved to football training kickers the same time this lifting period is, and my assistant is in cross country and they're running every day. So we'll pop in and out every now and then to check and see and make sure everybody's safe. And then we've got our trainer that's in that weight room at the same time. So that they're being monitored, but I have no idea who's in there and who's not. And I don't keep records, I don't write anything down. I just know when they would come up, they say, coach, I didn't able to make this morning. No, no problem. Here's a Mac on, get after it, but everybody else was there. But I think a lot of our success this year was built is they're starting to do it on their own. Nobody's being told what to do. Nobody's being made to do anything. And they're doing it on their own. They're building this team. In fact, as we started getting more and more successful every game, I kept saying, hey, you know, you guys did this. You know, you guys are the ones that made this happen because you've been up here every morning. Nobody's telling you what to do. You found heart and a bond in the team to be something special and different. You're doing what nobody else wants to do because you know what it takes. And I'm not making you do it. So it's your teammates that are making you do it. And that added the power to the leadership council. I've actually turned a lot of that power over to them. The year before last, we didn't even make the playoffs. You know, we couldn't score goals to save our life. But this year, we ended the rank number one in Region 1. You know, and the team chemistry has gone out the roof. And you'll hear a lot of that in the, the next 30 minutes. The, the boys talk about team chemistry. And they ask, uh, answer a lot of the questions that they ask. Because I thought it was important that, you know, when we talk about bond lifting before school not being mandatory, it would mean nothing unless I put kids up there that told you it's not mandatory. You know, and you'll see the kind of interaction between myself and the boys and the boys and the coaches understand that this is something that they're super proud of 
and they really appreciate what's happening and they buy into it and it's made all the difference in the world. I mean, really, that's probably the most powerful thing I, I've ever done as far as coaching. But that being said, Fred, you got anything that kind of go in depth on anything? Um, what's the, like, for someone like me, I, I haven't done leadership council before. I've had assistants who've actually run one for me in the past. Um, like, what's, what's the first thing I need to be doing? Surveying the players? Um, just find out. To me, the first thing yep. you do is get that extreme ownership. And I'll, I'll send you a link to that book. Okay. But it's also on that Jocko podcast. I mean, you can get to the, all the books from there. In fact, he's got that unbelievable podcast that goes with it. You know, in fact, when I moved here, I had no idea what podcasts were. But it took me a very short time of living in Dallas to realize the power of podcasts. <laughs> you know, you're driving all the freaking time. But that extreme ownership, I'd start reading that book. Before okay. the school starts up, I'd read that book. Now, a cool thing about extreme ownership is you didn't hear this from me, but there's also the PDF version because if the kids can't afford the book, I always tell them that probably your best idea is to buy the book. The thing you really need to do is buy the book and keep it as a reference. Yeah. And I would, you know, going back on that leadership strategies and tactics, I may wait for that. I may do extreme ownership first just off because it's just so good. And then the second thing I say on day one, when they walk in, I say, okay, on Friday, leadership council, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. If you're going to be a captain for us this year, you're going to attend leadership council every Friday at 30 minutes before whatever every time you start or after school, I don't know when your, your class period is yeah. and say the ticket to leadership council, you've got to read the book. Now, the thing is I can share you all my, my uh, Google forms, but to me, it's almost more powerful in setting up what you're going to talk about is to build your own Google form. So you kind of look at the certain ideas and highlights it and it's going to start off really, really good. You know, and like I said, you can't make them and you don't want to make them. You don't want anything like that to happen. You say, look, you know, this year, in order for you to be captain, you got to get, well, that's going to take all the kids that want to be captain. It's going to put them in there. So when your kids get voted on, they've actually been trained to be leaders. January 1st, There's Siri. She's jumping up out of nowhere. <laughs> but that's the first thing I do. And then as you go through the book, you know. Right you, here. God. Jeez. But, yeah, as you go through the book, just just call me on that first deal, and you and I sit and talk. And anybody that's out there, if you got questions, you know, email me. I'll be happy to jump on the phone and talk you through some of this stuff. What kind of stuff do you turn over to the leadership council? Like if there's conflicts within the team or punishments or stuff like that? No, we don't really punish that much because the kids hold each other accountable now. Okay. But a lot of it has to do with uh, – actually, you know, it's, this year, we were, last two years, we've gone to um, Amarillo for our overnight deal. I said, okay, what do you guys think? You want to go Amarillo or you want to go to Georgetown? And so they all discuss, oh, we want to go to Georgetown. Go, right, go to Georgetown. Uh, preseason, you know, what do you want to do? Who do you want to play? You want to keep the same preseason or something different? They go, oh, what do we think about this? You know, it may be even like – weightlifting their biggest thing is how do we improve weightlifting what do we have to do how do we get the guys in oh coach we think this okay we're not going to make them do it okay what do you think um might be fundraisers could be um but sometimes even like formations you know this is kind of sounds crazy and it's been really hard to swallow especially you know being full of ego you know four three three i think two years ago we started three five two and within three weeks the guys came in and say coach we'll keep doing that but we're going to have some questions and then so we sat down and talked about it in the end and said, well, why am I fighting this battle? They believe in this other thing. Let's just go with that and make it work, you know, mm -hmm. because here's kind of a thing. I, I stress this big time in the Saturday one, you know, and Jocko brings this up too. You're getting tired of hearing that. That's all right. But he's, he says, uh, you know, let's say you've got, you got your plan and they bring a plan to you that's almost as good as your plan. Not quite as good, but almost as good. What well, makes more sense to go with their plan? Because guess what? They're going to hit their plan with 100% energy, 100% because they got buy-in, right? Obviously, they're never going to deal with playing time. They're never going to talk about personnel on the field. You know, we're not going to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be a lot, of, a lot of things they take over. is like I say, okay, um, how do we get guys here? Because I want to start at go time, but I want you guys ready to go beforehand. How do we make that happen? So they come up with plans. Uh, ethos, which we're about to do here in a second, was 100% them because I went and said, okay, guys, here's the deal. How does a freshman know what to act like when he walks into our program? How does a freshman know what it takes to be a college heritage soccer player? And so I said on leadership council, this, and this was actually in our COVID stuff, I said, I want you to list out all the, the things, the attributes that a, a player would be the perfect college heritage soccer player. And I think it's probably a good time to kind of show that. And so they came up with like a list of like 60 or 70 things. And I said, okay, let's start putting in different pieces. I said, okay, well, you want me to go and put these things in blocks? They go, no, coach, we don't want you to do that. And okay. Well, um, you want to do it? So they said, oh, we'll take care of it. So this is them. I not, besides saying this is what I wanted, this is what they came up with. 
and it's pretty darn good. And they're the ones who wrote it. Hmm. And the beauty of it is, this is not mine. Yeah, that's cool. Now, to kind of go back to the extreme ownership, we talked about that, that battle in Ramadi when they had the blue on blue situation. And we had it this year, our only tie in district that we had, and we won the shootout, but nobody when we were beating people like three or four to nothing. I mean, it was, it was nuts. But had a had my starting goalkeeper get hurt. Within a minute after that, want to give up a PK. The kid that hadn't been on the, the varsity field was a, a sophomore. Jumps in, his first touch of the ball, his first play in actual action in the game is on a PK. He's defending a PK, goes in the goal. Well, you know, he could have gone in. You've been around people before, especially, you know, with the goalkeeper position. The first thing I do is, ah, what, that, blah, 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 yell at the kid. But the center back comes up, Mohan. He was on, he's actually on the call. Um, when I was in the goal and I did not save the PK, Mohan was the first one there to tell me, don't worry, it was my fault. He used to brush it off. It was my fault. In fact, he goes, I let the ball bounce in the box. I should never have done it. And the funny thing is, when we're talking about building this ethos, Logan was one that brought that up. And that's what he brought up in leadership council, talking about how powerful a moment that was. And that's kind of what's led to it. But this is there's, let me show you the second part of it. And so we talked about how ego is something that they call each other out on. They came up. That's, that's important enough to be in our, our deal. And then the last one, that reflects leadership council to a T. And so when I look at the, the group that I have, once again, going back to, you know, don't take any credit for it. I've got an incredible group of guys, but I, I think all of us do. I think every single program has incredible people. But I think it, it, it's incumbent upon us to come in and, and get the best out of those guys to, to be who they're supposed to be and to, to meet the potential. They all know what to do. They all know what it's going to take, right? But using them as the tool to make it happen is a thousand times more powerful, not just for soccer, but for life. I mean, if we could turn – fourth leaders in the future I mean who would want to be with these guys you know I'm unbelievably proud of them humbled by what they've accomplished but like I said it it was them together that made it happen I think once again leadership council is what what got us to that point you have them go over this or redo this every year as far as the I, I thought about that this is our first year to do the ethos yeah so I never tried it until this year so I think probably we'll do it my idea is that I'm going to take a, a picture of them playing and blur it out and then I want to put this over the front of it and make a poster out of it. And then, yeah, probably at the end of the year, we'll probably go back and look and rehash it and make it for every year. But the idea, and that's what I kind of told them, I want this to be so good that, you know, when you come on your 20th reunion, you walk in the locker room and on the wall is this ethos that you guys built. And so they always remember for what they accomplished and what they did. It, to me, it was something special. And that's what we're looking at. I think my fall deal, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them come up with a, what do you call it? A way to, evaluate or like player evaluation form but player evaluation form based upon the ethos and not on playing ability okay. so are they a player that are they humble you know what would the what would what would humility reflect and if i was to evaluate you on humility what would that look like player led what would that look like and, you know let me go back up to those other ones team oriented working harder competitor decision making you know how, how would we uh, evaluate players based upon those ethos that we develop the Colleyville heritage. And so I think it's going to be fall round two. Got a question from Gilbert. How many teams do y'all have? JVA, JVB, or one or two, however you declare them. And how do you incorporate all three teams? Separate councils per team or all together? Uh, so we have three teams, uh, JV1, JV2, and then varsity. And uh, all of them are together in the leadership council. And the reason being is that I think it's important because you go top to bottom. You tell them it doesn't matter if you're the last guy on JV or the, the top guy on varsity. We're all part of the team. So I always felt like it was important that the whole group has a say in what happens and what goes on. And that's kind of sideways. the reason behind it. <laughs> you want to tell your son he's sideways? Well, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's my kid, man. Yeah. I don't know. This gets around his mama. <laughs> Don't say that. Is that recorded? I'm in trouble. <laughs> hey, so if you really play on, there's a couple of kids that a lot of times will find a way to get rides. You know, so I know that 
that we don't really have a, a busing thing. We had some that they come in on buses, but most of the time we'll we'll put out a thing in the in our group chats and say, hey man, we need to find somebody and get a, a ride to so-and-so. And the boys have been really good about taking each other to a different place. Now, that being said, we don't really have a huge school district. So it's not like out in West Texas where you're going to send somebody 20 miles out of their way to go get somebody. I think the furthest distance we have is, is 10 miles or so. But a lot of guys will give other guys rides. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, boys. And then what's the normal size of leadership council is the next one up? So we, I'll answer that we, one since they're – I'll oh, go ahead, Lohan. You're going to take it? Yeah, I'll take it. We usually have um, – like, we never have more – we've never – I don't know if we've had more than 10, maybe, like, at the beginning. 15, 15, 15, 15. I don't know. It's never, it's never too big, but it kind of dies off after the beginning because people show up at the beginning – and then they're tired of waking up, so only the people who really want to be there end up being there. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So this kind of one, and then the answer, Jose, it says, do you guys have team conflict due to the amount of playing time? And how do you handle discipline in the classrooms? So I'll tell you from the front end, and th these guys will probably tell you different. But we keep our varsity pretty low on numbers. I think we're averaging 15 a year. And I do that for a reason, to kind of keep it to where only guys on varsity are the guys going to play and play a lot. And so I'm not sure that playing time is much of an issue because when you only have like three or four subs, then, then it works out pretty good as far as playing time. I always got a little nervous sometimes if somebody got hurt. But in the end of the day, it seemed to work out pretty good. How would you guys answer that? Yeah, I can't remember anybody really complaining about playing time. Maybe, too, that success breeds, you know, knocks out some of the problems. Yeah. Oh, there's Bryce. Okay, so how do you handle discipline in, in other classrooms? And I'll open up to y'all. I don't even know we've had much of that. I mean, there's been yeah. times, but usually it's just a uh, – I think it goes back to you talk about how you represent yourself in the classroom. If you look at the ethos the boys came up with, Right, the ethos, that's pretty clear in the ethos that, you know, you're expected to represent our team because as, as one of our players, we want you to understand that when you walk around the campus, you're, you're representing us as a group. And so I think the guys do a pretty good job of that. Can any of y'all speak to that? I mean, we had a couple of knuckleheads, but nothing major. Not anything like we had in Midland. Yeah, everybody was good in the classroom. Mm -hmm. No problem. I don't think it was more of the fact that we're representing the school. It's more the fact that, like, we really wanted to play. And so if we knew that if we knew that messing up grades would get in the way of us playing, then we would never let that happen. And so I don't think we had many problems with the grades this year. Yeah, even some of the, the people from last year that struggled in grades, they did a pretty good job. On um, the leadership council open to guys or girls, just the boys or the girls have their own. I think other programs have started. I mean it's kind of weird. This is probably going to be bad, but our, our relationship with the girls program isn't as strong as it has been in other schools I've been to. And I'm not really sure why, but in, in our group, you know, we just keep it straight to, to our leadership council. I know that they are actually having their own. Now tennis has opened up and now football has opened up. And so other programs are starting to do the leadership council, but as far as how that looks or what that looks like, I'm not sure. I mean, I would, I'd be all for bringing the girls into it, but I just don't think, I don't think it's something that's desired at this point. Next one is, do you guys encourage your teammates to come each week to leadership council? Or do you let – yeah, so I think we fit that. As far as encouraging, did y'all encourage other people to come? I think a couple of people that I, I thought should have come but didn't. Did y'all talk to them? I think one in particular should probably have been there. But it was that <laughs> don't, mood, don't do that. But, yeah, that would be – that would be something I think that they encourage them. But, once again, you can't. The part of the whole idea for this to work, is nobody can be made to do anything. And if you start making people do stuff, then you've got problems. Right? It all goes back to, to the players know what's right. They know what it takes to be successful. And now helping them to understand or helping them foster that success. And it works out good. Uh, that's a good question. We would pop in and out. right? So we've got a trainer who's got his office in there. Uh, we were blessed at, at Colleyville Heritage High School to have the pack. 
And so uh, the pack is an outside field turf. So I, every now and then I pop my head in while I'm working the kickers inside the, the pack where they were kicking. And then we've got our trainer that has got his office right in there in the room. And then Coach Evans would every now and then come in. The question at hand was uh, monitoring the weight room. Yeah, that's what I was, that, I was I didn't see it. Yeah, because that's a, I hate to say, it's probably a scary part of it at all. But when I'm outside, you know, I'd come in, the boys would take pretty good care of it. But often, I mean, what do y'all think? How We weren't in there that much. And the boys did a fantastic job, but they also knew that all they had to do is step outside, and I'm outside on the turf. And then, you know, Coach Evans would come in every now and then. I, I think other people, Hector, people tried to come in, and they're starting to mirror it because I know that we'll walk by in some of the offices around the pack that are filled with leadership council. Have you all seen that too, guys? Yeah. Uh, leadership council is usually Friday morning before the morning lifting program because it ends up being football game day. And so that would be the time that I'd try to come in and kind of watch the, the workouts on Friday morning because was, that's the day where we usually didn't have anything in the morning. And then, so we do that. And that's how we'd monitor it. All right. So we have any other questions? So I know we've opened that up. There you go. There's some questions in the chat. That's a good one. Yeah, you want to get those, then I'll, I'll get the the cut in seniors. Should have cut move a long time ago, but it just didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, we just. Uh... Yeah, hey, Lohan, you're gone, man. I didn't want you to bring this up till this this little thing, but you're now a Connor. Just kidding. But uh, what are the ones in the chat? What do you see, Moo? Here's a good one. Uh, if a conflict appears in the team, do the leaders of the team address the player individually or speak to the whole team? There were a couple of times y'all dealt with something. Wasn't there? Yes. I mean, I, I think I think our team was pretty good this year. I can't. I really can't remember very many conflicts that we had that were that were like a, just like the team hating on other parts of the team. I think there's a time for both, like to address in front of the entire team if it benefits the team as a whole. If it's something that's, you know, tiny and can be readdressed right then and there and not make a big deal of it, especially if there's some kind of past history, you can do that as well. It's just best judgment on both scenarios. Good point. You see any others in there, Mo, in the chat? I'll get some of these to come up. What are some things the coach didn't know about that the leadership council had to tell the coach? Oh, good. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I like that question. I didn't ask that. <laughs> or stuff that y'all dealt with outside that I had no idea. I don't know if they're going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, Moose Moose going to the Duke next year, so I don't. He can say whatever he wants, and we'll go and get held against him. I mean, I think just like personal matters, but like that, like just like that players. Yeah, I think anything that we didn't or that coach didn't know about it was just personal. So like, I guess he didn't need to know about it. It was just part of the team. No, and that's the beauty of it. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to deal with all this stuff? <laughs> and so there's some things, and I'll be honest with you, there's some things I don't need to know. Right. And just, that's kind of always been my opinion. There's some things that I don't need to know. Right? It's not going to help anything if I do. And if you guys bring that up again, I'll choke all y'all out. But that's, that's, that's always been my opinion. All right. Senior number is low on varsity. And everybody's welcome to leadership council. You're here to cut a senior that was on leadership council. I have not. You know, and it's kind of wild. I think part of it, if you, if you look at what the expectation of the team is, so let's take the early morning workout for example, right? It's not something that we make them do, but if you're a player that's not that serious, you're probably not going to do that, you know? So I think most of it's kind of a, been a process of weeding itself out. I know the first year that I was here, we had a ridiculous amount of seniors, right? And, and unfortunately, they didn't play very much. So I think part of it is, and I, I, I can only think of maybe a couple instances where there may be an issue coming up, but for the most part, those that are there are serious. And it's always been my opinion 
that if a kid's given everything he's got every single day, you know, it would it'd be stupid for me to, to cut him as a senior. Yeah, I can't do that. As long as you're a positive life force and we'll have that, that conversation individually with that player, saying as long as you're, you're willing to do everything you're asked to do, give everything you have and be a positive life force, not be a negative influence on the bench, then we'd love to have you. But the second that crosses that line, you're not with us anymore. And that has to be told from the very beginning. Now, as our numbers jump, that may become an issue in the future. But why would you not want that kid in? You know, because that kid also brings a perspective that may be different than somebody else that's been there and been the horse all the time. You know, that kid's going to see more sometimes in the background than, than any of the rest of us see it. So I think that's an unbelievably important part of the team. I uh, see. What do you do when you finish the book? You start, we, we start a new one right away. And so that's, that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's going on. So the books we've covered um, so far, we've done extreme ownership twice. Uh, God, what was it called? An audible. That was a really, really good book. That was about a guy that, that played high school football. They ended up coaching in the NFL and that's his highest rank, but it was somebody that graduated as a, with a degree in accounting. What are the books that we covered? Alex, I know he doesn't read. <laughs> so I, I don't know the name of it, but you've given us stuff from the dude who was in the military. Which one's that? The because I know we've uh, also did the uh, oh son, oh, what's that? Oh, God, the art of war. Sun Tzu, we've done that one. Um, there's other ones. Yeah, I have to. I have to look back at our our reading list. Probably need to start keeping a record of that. Oh, that's a good one. Hey, uh, Ricky asked, how does the information from leadership council meetings get relayed to the rest of the team? And does the info only get relayed when an issue arises? And that's more for the guys. We lose John. I mean, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You're good. I was just looking. I didn't see John in there anymore. I mean, usually since the leadership councils are right before the weight room, then usually it's just told just like, by word of mouth, just at the weight room, like while everybody's working out. So everybody kind of knows pretty immediately. Uh, one way I tried to like uh, show it to the JV2 kids, really just do it by example. When you mess up, acknowledge it. When others mess up, let them know in a good way, a, a constructive way that they've messed up. You need to work on this. Uh, just do it by example. I think that's really the best way to do it. And another way is if it was like a really, really big thing, coach would like announce a player to go and uh, like personally say it, like whenever we're in a huddle to the other players. So it doesn't come from coach. So it comes from a kid. And then one thing I don't think we discussed, there's anytime we have it, <laughs> it's your brother. Hey, uh, one thing that I want to bring up too is that there's a lot of sometimes when I have like a decision that I'm thinking about who to play, whatever. It's not not just player wise on the field, not personnel, but more like what teams we're going to play or what off season looks like, tournament stuff like that. For example, we we played in Amarillo for the last two years on one of our away deals, but I came to them today and said, okay, here's an option. So if it's something that that I think it'd be good to kind of get their opinion with. And I bring that to leadership council as well. So we're going to Georgetown this next year as a direct result of just some of the questions. So if there's something that, you know, I need to, to kind of get a gauge of something that they can help with decision making, I include them as many decisions as possible. Because it's, in the end of the day, it's our team. We're going to do this thing together. We're going to build it together and, and we're going to perform together. Are there any more questions in the chat? I think we're good right now. Can we open it up to the whole panel discussion yeah. thing and go back to As that? I, so for everyone listening, I'm about to just bring you in so you'll have access to talk. Uh, your video will be live as well if you have a webcam assigned. Uh, as I do that, though, I think we can all see when you have a bunch of young guys come in here and address a group. They might not know how many people they're talking to right now, but the way that they conduct themselves and the character they show in things like this shows that leadership council has got some teeth to it. I mean, 
I think the guys did a very good job. It's not easy to sit in a format that they're not familiar with and then address their ideas and answer questions. So well done, boys. All right. So what he's about to do is going to open it up to, to everybody. So you'll now see everybody like a regular Zoom meeting. And so what usually happens with this, it starts off with a presentation. And then after that, it's a, just a social session. So at this point, anybody can jump in and, and give their opinions. And, and I'm going to encourage those that have leadership council to also uh, kind of address any things that you see that have worked for you and, and help out the group as normal. And so as you start getting entered in and we get off the, the panel design, jump in. And like I said, I know Marty said he's, he's, he runs it, leadership council. Um, about a couple of people reach out and they've got it. Or any other questions you might have, now you're just open to, to do whatever you need to do. Hey, good job, boys, by the way. Proud of y'all. It was awesome. So, as usual, I didn't expect anything less, so it was do, really, really good. Do we leave now, or? It's, a, it's up to you if you want to hang out for a bit. It's going to be about 30 minutes. I'm going to try to get them to, when we open up the live questions, it should be able to let people come in and just ask straight away. Oh, uh, okay. In case y'all are wondering, y'all are talking to 33 people. Yeah. Should be everyone. Okay. Yeah. So now everybody's free. So if you want to ask, just pop in and ask and it'll bring you forward and everybody now is a panelist. Also, if you have anything you want to add to the whole concept, like for example, there was a question about disciplining um, a child in the classroom or whatever it may be. For us, it's setting the expectations at the beginning of the season. And if there's a continued issue, you have to act on it. A few years ago, we had to actually remove the, one of the best players I've ever coached in my entire life just because he was toxic both to the team in the classroom and to the opponents. And it took us – a two week window to kind of recover from that. But after that, the team actually started playing better because that guy was just, just too much. And what that did was set the tone for the next four or five years. That it doesn't matter if you're the best player in the program, you still are held accountable to the same standards as the lower performers. So. Oh, I just thought of JD. I think George has his hand up. <laughs> you could just go ahead and talk, Matt. You, got <laughs> you good? I didn't want to just jump in. But, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Again, appreciate like you, coaches, for uh, for doing this for us. It was awesome. Really enjoyed the input from the boys. Uh, like y'all discussed, that was really probably one of the most important parts of this whole discussion was hearing from them and how they took from it. Um, I do something very similar with my girls. Um, I just wanted to throw out an idea, something that I, I did that was a little bit different instead of just opening it up to everybody to, to, to come and join the meeting, we actually did like a blind, um, a, bl a, a blind uh, uh, answering of a survey. And I looked at their question, I looked at the, the results and their answers of these questions, and it was anonymous. Uh, they picked like a code name. And so I picked the girls to be in the leadership con uh, council based on their results. And so because it was anonymous, I had some freshmen in there. I had some sophomores, juniors. The whole gamut was represented in this council of about 15 girls. And some of them were the quietest people on the team that if you said, hey, who wants to be in the council? They would have never rose their, raised their hand, but they had the best answers. So they got to be in the council. And we kind of met throughout the year and brought up some of the top, the exact thing that y'all were doing, brought up some topics and talked about some things and, and from that group, a lot of ideas on how to improve our program came up. So I just want to be a component. This leadership council thing is a great idea, but I just want to throw uh, let y'all know my idea that I did a little bit different to who was involved in the council. And just like Coach Cottle, you couldn't be a captain unless you were in this council. So the interview process at the beginning of the year was pretty competitive because they knew come December when we're voting on captains, it was going to be from this select group. So, again, thank you, Coach Cottle, for everything that you did for us today. I know, special thanks to the boys. I mean, that's, that's really the result of the team. It's going to come from that group. So when people ask what it is, I said, I'm blessed with the unbelievable, unbelievable guys. I mean, you can already tell by these guys who represent well of our team. And so it's not me. I mean, if you got these guys, you can do anything. Well, tell them maybe not. I don't know. 
Cole can't even get out of bed to, to do this thing. So <laughs> yeah, that's that works just. Yeah, so at least at least you look comfy. <laughs> that works good. Hey, Coach Bales, who's behind me? Ask a question. I'm gonna call him outstanding gun. Uh, top of reading the book. What are other standards set in place by the LC uh, Leadership Council? Academic requirements, community service, as well as any other requirements. That's probably something I was. Now that we got that in, I think community service is something we got to look at. You know, I think as, as we start to progress in the future, that has to be something that's a, a part of what we do. Because we've got an unbelievably good a group of guys that could be a, a powerful force of good, especially within our community. And that should be something we'll stress in the future. That's something we haven't done. Academic requirements, we really haven't had an academic requirement for it. And I'll tell you, part of that is uh, Colleyville Heritage is an unbelievable school. You know, and the academic deal, I mean, their they're, kids are pushing themselves mostly, for the most part, are pushing themselves pretty hard. You know, and that's, I said, the reason we moved here in the first place was the, the academic issue. I mean, for my kids, and that's pretty much why we're there. Does anybody else have any other questions? Like I said, you're all in. Do we Good morning. In here? Good morning, Go Coach Cotto. Good morning, Good morning coaches. Uh, just excited to, to be here and hear all the information that you guys have. I'm from El Paso, Texas. I'm the coach for Bel Air High School. Uh, it, it seems to me there's a lot of information about you guys giving us what, what you're talking about. And uh, the, the issue that I find is that there's different types of economical situations, high schools, uh, culturally, that I think uh, things have to be done very differently. Um, in my situation, I grew up, I grew up in Mexico and then played uh, years of professionalism in Mexico and Brazil, Argentina and the States. And what I've learned throughout my experiences is, uh, I'm just going to say it flat out, when there's a level of a higher economical situation and, and education, um, kids, uh, it's easier to build a program like the one that you have, Coach Hoddle, because you have the support of parents, you have the support of, of a lot of people. And what, what's exciting for me is that in my area, it, it's very low economically. And so what we do is uh, peer pressure. We have a program called Lord, Lord of the Flies. I wrote Lord of the Rings, but it's Lord of the Flies. And what we do is we want friction. We want them to have a power struggle between teammates where, where you have – kids that want to do well, which is a minimal, I, I can say 10, 15 percent, want to work hard, want to pay the price, the Michael Jordan price of just doing what you're supposed to do. And the other ones just want to try to cut corners. And uh, every year what, what I've, what we have accomplished as, as a, as coach and staff and is a program where, where by the end, when the season starts in, in uh, January, we have uh, 85, 90% of the issues solved and the work ethic has changed because the peer pressure is so much from the kids and, and you know, you, you, you're in the fine line of bullying and that issue about that. But I think we set the rules right where you can do things, but you are allowed to, to, to ask a player to stop practice if he's not going to practice, you are allowed to to be upset at a teammate and explain to him that he can't do that. So there's a point where where the the good side of of the program starts eating the cancerous side of of the of the other of the team, and you flush out the five or six players that really don't want to. And then you have that information. Then you have a whole team that is is has an objective of pro of progression, of getting better and better and better. And uh, and I think there's. I mean, I'm excited. I've worked with both sides where I tell a kid do something, and it's amazing they do it and they follow instructions. And then I'm more excited about working with those kids that you tell them to do things, but they won't accept it until you convince them. You convince them that it's for their own good, for their future, for everything that they're, they're wishing they could do. So 
in that sense, I, I think that uh, that uh, leaders, usually what I do is I, I cater to the freshmen a lot. So by the time they're sophomores and juniors, they're playing a lot of, they're playing a lot of uh, varsity. They're, we train together, the freshmen train together with the varsity and they're pushed very hard and that starts, that's the peer pressure and, and you could tell that the freshmen are scared. They're scared of, of, of competing. And so when we teach this type of peer pressure, we teach them that they're going to fail and the peer pressure is to accomplish the failing side and accept it. You're going to fail today tomorrow but then you're going to get better 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 and and I feel that what you're doing coach Cotto and the program is very similar uh it's very organized and and I've learned a lot of things the books I'm for sure I'm, I, I'm a reader so I'm going to read those books and and appreciate your invitation thank you thanks coach Delgado. thanks for sharing too by the way hey so um I emailed Coach Cuddle because we're basically neighbors and uh, we're about 15 minutes apart between our schools. And I'll say I kind of, I kind of represent the middle of the road between uh, Sergio and, and, uh, and Warren in that I have a lot of kids. So we have, we have like 74 different languages spoken in our school because we have like really close access to the airport. Our district's extremely diverse and we have diversity in economic situations as well. Um, so we have some very uh, financially stable kids. We have some very wealthy kids and we have some kids who like, you know, they're going to miss half the practices in the year because they've got to work to help their family survive or whatever. So, um, we have a very diverse group and uh, I'll say that I think that, uh, everybody's situation is unique. Um, and the challenges that they deal with, but uh, I will say that the thing that really has made the biggest difference at Bell is, uh, like when you find that you're no longer telling the kids um, how to how to lead, and they start telling each other. And so I have a really strong group of leaders that are so they're juniors now; they'll be seniors next year, and they're teaching the younger kids how to be those kind of leaders. And it has made all the difference in our program. Um, I don't. I haven't done some of the things that you guys have done. Um, I want to take some of the things and steal some of your stuff, Ron, because uh, that's what we're here for anyway. So, but uh, and you guys at at uh, Colorado Heritage, man, I'm excited for you. I'm super excited to see how well you've done, how far you've come, and how far you can go. I'm really bummed that you guys, as well as the rest of us, didn't get a chance to finish off this one. But uh, but I want to see you know where everybody goes next year. And I think that the proof um, is kind of in the results. Like you do this for a couple of years. We, it's, it really took us two years of having good leadership in place to get to the point where we were competitive and not, and not afraid of anybody. Um, and I think that really speaks to what you guys are doing because I feel like, uh, you know, when you take the field and if you play the game and you believe in each other, you believe in your purpose, you believe in the leadership, you believe in the uh, training that you've done. And, uh, man, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have the most talented kids. You have to have the most buy-in. And uh, your kids are bought in, you know, they're going to, they're going to fight to the last second. You may not win every game, but you know, the kids aren't going to quit on you. And uh, so I really, I really love to see that kind of thing. Um, what we do that's a little different from this is we take all of our returning varsity players and they each get a group and uh, we assign them because we don't get our freshmen until November. Um, our campuses are all, we've got junior high kids that are in ninth grade. So they come over starting in November. And so when they start coming over, all of our training varsity players are their group leaders. And it's very quick that you can see who uh, is really cut out to be a leader and who is still kind of just floundering in it. You know, they're just they're not really sure what, what to do or how to, how to lead. And, uh, and so you can kind of work with those guys to help them. You can't make them leaders, but you can kind of help them cope with the difficulties of being the person responsible and it gives them a little bit more perspective of you know what it takes to be a captain or what it takes to be a varsity player the younger guys especially um and I mean it's it's really made a big difference for us but uh, I really think 
um, from this, from what you guys are doing over there. I really think I want to open this up. I was talking to, actually, while we're doing this, talking to some of my captains from last year. I think we're going to open this up to some of the younger guys now because uh, I really think that uh, there's some valid input. And I know that our summer dedication programs kicked off. Thankfully, it's still going as long as we don't have any of these cases of the virus or whatever getting a hold of somebody. But, um, but I've had some of the younger guys who, who really want to be excellent varsity players and good leaders. And they're in there. Some of the kids I never thought would show up, you know, freshman kids from homes that, I mean, you got, you know, they've got to babysit somebody and um, they're coming from the, the lowest income area, but they're showing up, they're putting in the work that we're starting at seven in the morning. They're, at, they're there at six thirty, you know? And so um, in the summer, and I'm like, why am I here at six thirty in the morning in the summer? This is crazy. But, uh, but they really put in a lot of work and they're buying into it because of, because of the example they're getting from the older guys. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think it's great what you guys are doing. I think we're going to take some of your ideas and, and uh, expand our program as well. Yours, yours is much more advanced uh, in more advanced stages than ours is. So I think that's great stuff. And I think it goes back to that first poll, you know, so in the, in the beginning we said, you know, how many of y'all blame leadership for, for lack of success? And then how many have the leadership programs in place? I think the key is to have the leadership program in place. And I also believe that the kids are able to do it, to do powerful things once they're given, you know, that message. And so I think it's, what we've done here will go beyond Colleyville Heritage, you know, as they start to learn and start to go and grow on. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> And he's a cutie. Look at him. That's a good job. That's, that's, that's uh, Maradona. That's Maradona. Oh, yeah. Not like Messi, Maradona. Yeah, he's good. Blonde haired Maradona. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, does anybody else have anything to, to jump in and share? Like I said, this the beauty of the, the post uh, deal is just the openness that we've had so far to, to connect. Does anybody have anything they want to put into it? Well, with that being said, I, I appreciate you guys spending uh, Saturday morning again with us. Uh, next week, we're looking forward to it. We'll get that link out. I think it's going to be our link for a while uh, to keep it going so you always have access to it. Uh, and encourage people to, to join in. Like I said, I think this has been one of the most powerful things that started off from Ben at uh, Grand Prairie or South Grand Prairie High School when he had this idea. It was a beautiful idea. And like I said, I've enjoyed each week and, and being with you guys and learning. And each round, I, I feel like I get better and better. But thank you so much for your time and commitment for this Saturday morning.